Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kathy Hawks from the Office of External Relations and thank you all for joining us today. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Joseph Doyle. Joseph is the Irwin Shell Professor of Management here at MIT Sloan. He studies the effects of foster care and other interventions in child outcomes, the returns on healthcare spending, and the role of health insurance on treatment provided to patients and other health outcomes. His work has been featured in USA Today, The New York Times, New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, Boston Globe, and The LA Times. Please join me in welcoming Professor Doyle. I think I should applaud you for coming in on a beautiful day to listen to an economist for an hour. This, you guys are the, the hardcore. I love it. <laughs> Welcome. You could have had Matt Damon. You have Joe Doyle. I don't know if that's, that's going to work. But here we go. No, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you guys back. I love talking at reunions. Um, you know, MIT is a special place. And as you get farther from it, it keeps, gets even more special, I'm sure. The problem sets fade in the distance. And the, uh, the friendships are the one things you remember. So welcome back. I hope everyone's having fun. Uh, what do we do today? I wanted to give you a lecture and uh, have a more of a discussion than a lecture, to be honest, about measuring returns to healthcare. So I was going to break this down into three parts, thinking about where to but healthcare costs in the US, um, the potential value in healthcare in the US, and then credibly measuring value for the second half of the lecture, which is what I do for a living as a health economist. So um, first, I wanted to get a sense of my audience here. So how many of you are like, physicians, doctors, or in the healthcare industry? OK. Yeah, so you guys can help me out with, uh, with facts, especially the clinical ones that I don't uh, pretend to, uh, to be an expert on. But the economics part, I do pretend to be an expert on. So, <laughs> um, so here is a map from, or a mapping of time. So this is 1970 to 2010. And this is percent of GDP spent on healthcare. And uh, we're number one, USA. <laughs> we are number one. We're cruising up toward 18% of GDP today. Um, and then there's a whole gaggle of OECD countries around between 6 and 10%. Um, this is Korea, if you're interested. What's intriguing to me are a few things. One is, wow, we're number one. Two, we've grown so much faster than the others. We started off in 1970 kind of in the pack. We were at the top of the pack. And people thought, hey, we're the number one spender there, too, or right around there. But we're just so far and away number one now. That's the, new, that's the news. And so there's a puzzle sort of where that's coming from. I'm going to open it up in a second to ask you guys where you think it's coming from. But to set the stage a bit more, about a quarter of the federal budget is spent on health care. And so as you see that growth in spending, um, if that continued to happen, that this orange part, piece of the pie is going to keep growing and growing and growing. And so that uh, gets people nervous. And so they get nervous about what's called the cost curve. This is what the cost curve is. This is the fraction of GDP over time. And so we saw that it's been growing. And if it continued at current um, pace, given the patient characteristics and the inflation rate of, uh, of pricing in healthcare, then we'd be 100% of GDP by 2082. So yeah, it'd be kind of hard. You don't get to eat, but you would get a feeding tube in the hospital. Um, so obviously, unsustainable growth is not sustained. No, we know we're going to change that, that path. But everyone's concerned, how do, we bend the, how do we bend the cost curve? That's the harder part, um, the harder part to happen. So, why do we spend so much on healthcare? So this, I'm not going to cold call on you. It's, you know, I'd be very mean to do that. But why, why do you guys think we spend so much on healthcare? What's your pet favorite theories? Liability. Liability is, are you a physician? No. Because so that's, doctors, the number one answer is always liability. They hate liability. They hate lawyers, I think, in general. Um, they, they don't like to be sued. Now, so why liability? Why do you, why do you think it's true? Medical and malpractice. Okay, so if. Medical malpractice insurance, what fraction of spending on GDP do you think that is? It's tiny, OK? But it doesn't mean that that's not the answer, because when people are afraid of getting sued, they might do things like run extra tests, do extra procedures. It's called defensive medicine, OK? The other thing that can puzzles me a bit about malpractice insurance premiums, which people hate to spend on, is that in most industries, when there's a cost shift, some of that gets passed on to consumers. And that's particularly the case in health, US healthcare. So, I don't, I'm not that sympathetic to, well, look at my premiums. They're so high. Well, look at your income. It's so high, too, because you're passing on some of the costs to insurers. Um, the other thing we know about liability is that if we do the normal reforms that people say, like cap payments that would be made to people if they sue, we, we study those policies. We've had 25 years of policies like that at the state level. 
they have zero effect on defensive medicine or the, how people practice medicine. And um, so that doesn't say that liability is not important still. It's that the reforms that we typically talk about solving the liability problem, the way we've been implementing them, they're not working. I do think, and this is just a conjecture because we don't have great evidence on it, that doctors don't like to be sued. Less, it's less about the dollar amounts because they're insured. It's about the time, it's about the stress, it's about it's not comfortable being sued. So I think the answer was we'd have to find a way to reduce the number of lawsuits and not the dollar amounts that get changed hands. Yeah? We have one of the unhealthiest populations. One of the unhealthiest populations. Um, so in what, yeah, what ways are we unhealthy? When we eat. Our As you're eating your salad, but there's some dressing on it, right? <laughs> no dressing. You're our savior. This is a, we, we want more salad eaters. Pardon me? Drug abuse. Drug abuse recently, yeah, this opioid epidemic, we're leading to more mortality, yes? Uh, because the buyers and sellers don't directly contract with each other, uh, there's a little pricing discipline. There's little pricing discipline when, I like to think about it as, let's say you go to, the, um, to a restaurant, you sit down, and someone else comes over and orders your food, and then you eat it, and then somebody else pays the bill. It's like, like who's going to be watching what's going on in that case? Now, we kind of rely on payers to do that. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, they are hopefully keeping an eye on, on spending and what they're paying hospitals. If we go to Medicare, however, Medicare is a great check writing organization. They love, they just basically write checks. They can run, help fund studies, very good studies showing that a state of the art technique that's very expensive is not effective. And then they say, but will we pay for it? Yes, we'll pay for it. They're very bad. Politically, it's very hard for them to say no to anything. It's a little bit easier for Blue Cross, but they still have political backlash when they start saying no to things. I'll take a couple more on that, yeah. You said incentives? But yeah, I'm an economist, so I'm just like, yes, of course, incentives, yes. So, what, and it sort of gets to your point, but what, what do you think? It's a fee-for-service world, right? You do it, you pay, you do more, you get paid more, you just go backlash, but you make it, so you just do more and more and more. Yeah, it's another sort of way that Medicare and other organizations that follow their lead like to write, like to write checks, that if we pay for the quantity of care, and it's basically like a cost reimbursement system, then you're gonna get higher costs. So we are, you know, the big idea in healthcare is to change the way we pay for healthcare. So start paying for quality of care instead of quantity of care. Um, just one point on that. So we're trying to encourage accountable care organizations. These will be large scale, vertically integrated firms that can deliver care in the hospital and out of the hospital. And then we would start paying those accountable care organizations a capitated rate, so a, a, a fixed amount. And so that the more they do, the, they're not gonna get paid more. And then hopefully the, their answer is not to do zero, which would be profit maximizing in that case. Um, so we were going to have quality incentive programs that are built on top of it to keep the quality up as well. So one thing that's interesting to me there, so right now surgeons, for example, are the, they're the revenue center of a hospital. Once we move to ACOs, the surgeons, who have you know, some ego, a little bit of ego, the surgeons are gonna, be, they're gonna flip it. They're gonna be the cost center of your institution. So before they were, had these very big egos and they were, they were the rainmakers for the entire organization. Now they have very big egos and they're the cost center. People are gonna be yelling at them to stop. It could create some kind of, you know, we'll have to have some change management. In fact, when we think about healthcare and reform of healthcare, I think a business school is not a bad place to start, um, start doing collaborative research. So I'm working with Red Steph Levy in operations research and Kate Kellogg, who is a, um, a sociologist who, who thinks about how change does happen in institutions. And there'll, there'll be a lot of need for that going forward. All right, I'd like to keep talking about that, but let's, we're gonna open it up to more questions in a minute. So why do we spend so much on healthcare? Yeah, you've mentioned a lot of good reasons. Um, okay, if people really wanna talk about this, fine. I'd rather talk about whatever you wanna talk about than what I had planned. So, um, so hospitals, there's a lot of money spent on hospitals, absolutely. So yeah, if you wanna just say, where is it? So prescription drugs, for example, 10% of spending. Hospitals, you know, half the spending. And then you said, I figured somebody else said something. Administrative oversight. Administrative oversight, by whom? Reporting, 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 checking, checking, and making sure you're selling the eyes. That's expensive. Paperwork. So yeah, there is paperwork. I mean, it's a little bit tricky on the, like what's the optimal amount of paperwork? We've, so one idea is to just pay this capitated rate and don't let it grow very fast and then forget about all the reporting. You guys figure it out. One thing I like to think about, it, in the 90s, um, we asked insurers to start reducing spending, right? They're health maintenance organizations. They started reducing the rationing care. People hated that. They hated it. And then if we uh, think about the government re rationing spending, that's a death panel 
Literally, that's a death panel when they start saying no to things. So then our last hope, I think, is to give the scalpel to spending to the um, physicians, essentially, uh, people who run healthcare, healthcare providers. And that's what these uh, ACOs or accountable care organizations are trying to do. So maybe that would start reducing administrative burden. All right, should we, we should raise the price of Ambien to $100 billion, right? <laughs> There's a lot of talk about these Savaldi and Hep C drug, you know, I think the fact that it was priced at about $1,000 a pill didn't help their public relations. A $1,000 pill just sounds bad. Um, Gilead, who makes Savaldi, they invented something that's truly miraculous. It saves, <coughs> it cures hepatitis C now in like eight weeks, you know. Um, and so what they priced it at, they priced it at the going um, treatment costs for hepatitis C, where they could have, which is horrible. Before that, was was not very good. So they, they have this product that's much better than the current standard of care. They're charging with the current standard of care because they didn't, they, they didn't want to charge too much. And then they get slammed in the press for charging too much. And the reason why they got slammed is because the price wasn't that bad in terms of if you just if you were in the industry, you wouldn't think it was that crazy, and especially since it was so much better. But the quantity, so price times quantity is what people pay, and the quantity just went way up, especially for Medicaid systems and other systems. This was so good that everybody who thought they had hepatitis C now came out of the woodwork, and they wanted to get cured, and they didn't anticipate that, and so this price times quantity started. All the growth in spending for Medicaid, for example, is attributed to these types of drugs, and that's you know, is almost uh, a version of success you could think of. Also, this company, Gilead, they had one of the best reputations before this in the world. Like, they would give away H HIV drugs um, to third world countries. They, were, they would give away their patents to, um, in third world countries to save lives. Like, they had the nicest reputation of all, and then they got slammed. They kind of got brought in with these kind of guys who would buy orphan drugs or small drugs, and they would jack up the price for no reason in terms of, you know, it wasn't any better now. It was just that they had regulatory frictions that didn't allow other people to come in and compete away the profits, which isn't exactly the economists don't even like that kind of profit making. It's sort of just, uh, um, we call it rent seeking. It's, it doesn't have any value to society. It's just changing who's paying for it, who's getting the, the spoils and who's not. Um, I don't have too many, I don't want to have too many numbers, but hey, I'm an economist, so here we go. So this is the cumulative percentage of total spending on healthcare. By, and so the cumulative means it'll be 100 at the end. And this says that 5%, 5 of the US population, we're spending 50% of healthcare on this 5%. And then this old 80-20 rule, 20% of patients account for 80% of all healthcare spending. So in some ways, if we're spending you know, half of our dollars on 5% of patients, this eats away a little bit at the incentive story and other things. I still think, as an economist, that that's a huge story, but we're in a, we're an industry that nobody cares about costs, so, even, so then that just leads to profligate spending in general. But some of it is these catastrophic guys or people that we were just spending tons and tons of money on. 40% of the people in the top 5% will be in the top 5% next year as well. So it's not like they're all passing away. It's not all of end-of-life dollars. There are this core set of people that are going to be spending a lot of money on each year. So those are like chronic sufferers, chronic consumers of, <coughs> of healthcare spend. Uh, if you unpack those two slivers, the one that's on five percent even that, that entire bucket, uh, what do we know about it? Are you going to, like, what do we know about why uh, is such a spike? And what can we do to manage that? And maybe we some trickle down benefits. Well, I'm doing some research, and I'll talk about it uh, for a little bit about with uh, Dr. Jeff Brenner at the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. Jeff's won the MacArthur Genius Award, and he's like a leading thought leader on bending the cost curve. And his big idea is to target these guys, called super utilizers, and sort of lavish them with care management. So literally accompany them with nurses to their doctor's appointments. Um, you end up spending less in the long run. Our US healthcare system is so expensive that if you could reduce their hospital admissions by, you know, by 10, 20%, it would more than pay for this, you know, hold these people's hands basically hang out with them forever, and like, that would pay the wages of those people just because it's so expensive, our health, US healthcare system. We, 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 yeah, there's some evidence that this kind of care management will work. There's a large, payers have disease management and care management um, writ large for diabetic patients or hypertensive patients. There isn't good evidence that they save a lot of money, but we're hoping that if you target like, with a very intensive program, by the way, his program is not just clinical, it's also social, so they're trying to make the people's lives better in lots of ways. Um, like get them signed up for 
um, credits that they have. But some of them, for example, will be like a homeless patient who, who's going to the hospital you know, 15 times a year, and then their Medicaid's being charged for that. Um, and so one of his programs is try to get people, it's called housing first, get you in a house first and then start dealing with all your other problems. And that has some evidence of dramatic improvements. You can imagine that you'd be chasing your tail if you just keep you know, treating them in the hospital, teaching them how to use the primary care system, which they're probably not going to use, and then just they're back on the street. How is this uh, data different in other countries? You saw it with kind of comparative to other countries. Is all countries have the same profile? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, it's absolutely true that it's skewed distribution in all the, all the countries. Um, and that'll be, in other countries, it'll be due to quantity of care, so less than price variation. And here, are two. The, we're just having a lot of quantity of care here. And one reason why we're by and far the largest is because our prices are higher, and they've grown faster, the prices of the P times Q equation of the expenditure. So our quantities have been going up, but the price times Q is really, the P part is why we're different from other countries in, in general. And then we mentioned this about um, the incentives and who's paying for it. And I did want to raise this issue. So I call it fourth party payment. So the insurance is going to pay the provider. The employer pays for the insurance. And then the premium that the employer um, has to, they're fully shifted to, the, to wages. So wages have been stagnant in this country, but compensation hasn't been so stagnant. We've been spending our growth and productivity on ever increasing healthcare premiums. And so we get this hidden cost of healthcare. People like their healthcare. You talk, heard about this in the healthcare reform debate. I like my healthcare. Yeah, because um, your premiums haven't been going up as much. Your wages haven't been growing, though. That's a hidden part. Like, people don't recognize that they are paying higher prices. It's just that their wages, it's not coming out of their paycheck as a number, bigger number. It's that their base salary hasn't been growing as fast. When in that kind of situation, you, you don't have really the, the voters being mad. You don't have consumers being mad. Um, one person that could be mad would be the insurance, and that depends on the bargaining power between insurance companies and providers and local markets of who gets the spoils in this kind of who cares about the cost mentality. And then I'm a health economist, and I'm enamored with this RAND health insurance experiment that ran in the late 70s, early 80s. The reason why we don't have a big update to that, although we had a, a, um, one piece of evidence recently, but... If, this would, today, if you were to do this today, it would cost $300 million to randomize families, about 3,000 families, to different insurance plans and see how they consume care. And so some people in this experiment had to pay 95% of the bill up to a certain cap, and then they were you know, protected financially after that. Other people had to pay 50% of the bill, 25%, and some people had free care. And the families were literally randomized to these um, different kinds of co-payments. So relative to the people that had to pay out of pocket basically the whole bill, free guys spent four times as much on health care during the trial. And it's not that they're healthier or you know, sicker or anything like that. They are exactly the same because of the randomization. And then for mental health care, it was two to one. They, they were spending twice as much. So when people think, well, health care is different. Economists, you know, why are you talking about health care? Health care is very different. If you, need, if you get sick, you need to go get care. People wouldn't respond to prices, right? Well, if we randomly assign prices to people, they, they do respond to the prices. All right, so now the question is, is our health care spending worth it? So a lot of the things you talked about, administrative burden, you know, who gets excited about that? So Valdi, you could get more excited about. It is uh, curing people. So what do you guys think? Would you, do you think all of our spending is worth it? We're spending, uh, no? All right, raise your, if you got sick tomorrow, would you fly to Canada? Anybody fly into Canada? <laughs> Okay, what are you flying for? Um, probably uh, an expensive, unusual episodic surgery for which my insurer is highly skeptical and would push a lot of the costs onto me. So and that's a great know. point. So <laughs> access, access to care. Here we have insurance companies that might not want to do experimental things. In Canada, we generally think that they're more stingy than the US, like for 99% of things, but maybe there's this rare thing that they'd be more generous on. That's yeah. possible. Um, certainly people drive to Canada to get drugs. What are some of the things that are common about these things? Are the prices will be lower in Canada. You know? And so insurance companies would be, would be nervous about high price things here. And, um, and certainly you could pay less, you have lower prices for drugs, for example, if you go to Canada. Is that through regulation? Is it a regulation or is that free market? Is that free market? Yeah. So one reason people say, why are you, as an economist, studying healthcare is that like, perfectly competitive markets do not describe healthcare. And you, in Canada, 
um, there is no free market in healthcare. There's a giant single payer called the Canadian government. That's very different. In the US, we have you know, about 45% of all births are paid by Medicaid. We have Medicare that um, represents, well, Medicare and Medicaid represent about half of spending in the US. So we have big government involvement in healthcare spending and regulations. Um, but the other thing is we allow um, insurance or big pharma to develop drugs and then get a patent and be able to charge lots of money for their drugs. Um, and then other countries can kind of free ride on that. So they will bargain. Their big you know, Canadian um, healthcare system will then bargain with the, with the drug companies and they can get lower prices by bargaining. We, and we, our Medicare system is sort of not allowed, not allowed to do that. Sure. The VA negotiates with entities like that in the United States. That's right, yeah, the VA is good at negotiating. Now, there's one question of like, well, do we want to have Canadian prices for drugs? And so the downside of that would obviously be um, concerns of her, do we have as much innovation as we do now? So maybe the US is providing this sort of public good for the world of paying huge prices and bankrupting our government <laughs> so that we can have new you know, antiretroviral drugs that get developed because they know they would make billions in the US and make nothing in other parts of the world. So is it worth it? I think it's an interesting question. I mean, one thing that people have in mind, I think, is this graph. So this is, the bar graph is average life expectancy and it's sorted by that. So here's Japan clocking in at 81 and a half. And here uh, is the US here, we're at 77. You know, you know, five years, who cares, right? I mean, no, I'm just joking. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're kind of low here. We're next to Cuba. So uh, break out the cigars. Um, <laughs> and then the red line is per capita spending. And I already showed you that you know, we're number one on that. We're the outlier of spending. So if we're spending so much more, and no, people aren't living longer, then we go back to our, well, one idea is that it's not worth it. And another idea would be, well, we're, we're, we are in worse health, or it's really hard to compare us to other countries be, based on lots of differences across the US and other countries. Sorry to interrupt you, uh, question. Uh, all your slides are gorgeous. Are you going to make them available to us, or are they protected by IP and social media? Take pictures. Please don't take pictures. It would make me nervous. So yeah, you can, I'll post it on my website. Okay, um, yeah, you just Google me, Joe Doyle, MIT, and I'll put them up. Uh, want to pay to well, the other thing is I'm, I'm like, it's a bit of a fire hose because I feel like you guys took a nice day and decided to be here. I might as well ply you with, ply you with numbers and information. But if I'm doing too fast, you know, just yell at me. I don't, I won't be nervous. Yeah. Um, I read something about this statistic, and tell me if it's wrong, that in some ways it's misleading about the U.S. So, for example, if there's a preemie baby that's born, we'll go to great lengths to try to save the child. And therefore, that counts against our average life expectancy, whereas in other countries, they may not go so, they may not try to save the baby, and therefore, it actually may skew those numbers because it's not an apples to apples. Is that, is that an accurate statement, or is that inaccurate? I would, in general, I'd say it's inaccurate. But the, uh, you know, so we can get into lots of different debates about how you're going to define human life, and so maybe we do define it uh, differently. But some of my um, colleagues in the econ department have looked deeply into the data, so I'm going on there. Um, their take on, on that question. And what they find is that um, they don't find that the difference is coming from, they were looking at infant mortality, but it's the same, um, you know, zooming in. Um, they don't find that it was a difference in the definition of fetal, fetal deaths and um, who's born and who's not. And they, they didn't find that it was within 30 days that we were finding that we were, say, worse on life expectancy. Um, but it was in 30 days to one year that they found the big difference in um, why are infant mortality rates not ranking very well compared to other countries? So that rules out, I think, that early definitions part. And it actually is pretty interesting to think about, well, what's different about day 30 to day 365 that we're so much higher than other countries? And so then you can get back into well, access to care. Maybe Medicaid's not as good as it should be, so on. This is great, yeah. Um, I think you referenced it earlier, but a lot of there's been a lot of talks about how much we spend in the last year of life. Right. Um, so it'd be interesting to see a graph like this to show what is the per capita spending on that last uh, marginal year of, of the average life expectancy. And yeah. Or is the United States an outlier there as well? That's a good question. I looked only in the US on that. And I do see, you see the exponential growth in spending in the last year of life. How many know that your last year of life, when is your last year of life? <laughs> That's the crux of it. Like, we just don't know, right? So. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, then I'm not going to spend a ton of money on you. But if I think if I spend a ton of money on you, it might save you for six months, you might be willing to do that. So that's where the, it gets tough to answer that question. 
I'll take two more and then I can take one more slide and we'll go back to whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, this, this slide begs the question of medical tourism and I, I think that there's going a lot of I'm oh, sorry? He's going to Canada for him. <laughs> so, so I've heard of people going to Thailand, going to uh, India for heart operations because you have skilled practitioners there and um, you know, the cost is a lot less than it costs to pay or if you're paying yourself. So I've heard that insurance companies have explored this, like you know, sending people to Ecuador or wherever. Is that like a way to address this outlying aspect that, that you actually have government payers saying, okay, well, you know, we can't do this procedure of, uh, you know, affordably in the U.S. Go to this, you know, approved clinic in Panama City or something like that. Is that yeah, I mean, they, so yeah, as an economist, your arbitrage is very attractive. So this is like going to Toronto to buy your drugs, going to Ecuador to get the surgery. Um, it's not a big part of the market right now. You were nodding that you think it's, it's a potential winner, or you think is, um, I wanted to hear your. In, in the limit, I mean, you could have. In the limit, yeah. You could have specialty care concentrated for particular surgeries on a cruise ship off San Diego and, and really uh, meet a whole lot of regulatory issues. And if you think about the tourism in general, just the, the dollar amounts now, I mean, we get a lot of people coming here for care as opposed to people going over to India to get um, get treatment. But it is, you know, it is part of the, the market. It's just a relatively small part right now. And I do get nervous with, uh, you know, I'm doing a lot of research on what hospitals get better outcomes. And the best, and contrary to just a correlation in the data, teach, like fancy teaching hospitals, and the, if you just look at a correlation in the data, they don't get better outcomes than other hospitals, but they treat a lot more patients that are a lot sicker. All right, so even if you could start to control for how sick people are in the data that you have, they still look they don't, like they don't do much better. So I'm gonna talk about later about natural experiments where you randomly assign naturally occurring randomization of patients to different hospitals. And when I do those apples to apples comparison, the really fancy hospitals are getting better outcomes. And one explanation is that they, they're good at a lot of things. So I do worry that if we start, if something goes wrong on the cruise ship, you know, I'd rather be something go wrong on the fifth floor of MGH and be able to go to the seventh floor to fix it than to be in, uh, ca you know, Captain Steubing coming over and wondering what's going wrong. <laughs> See, I love the reunion crowd because they get all my 80s uh, jokes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. That's a good question, yeah. So these are OECD countries, and um, I honestly don't know. I've known people that do research in China um, and India, and it's a very different system. They, they're, um, in India, the prescription drugs, there's a lot of, counter, a lot of uh, I would say, counterfeit, but people don't take the IP very seriously in the, uh, on the, in the drug market. So then drugs are, ch are very cheap, and um, yeah. But there are lots of different generic companies that haven't licensed their anything, yeah. Um, so I don't want to go. I don't want to say things I'm not sure about. So or, you know, don't know as well. All right, here's another eye candy piece I think, which is the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare. You could Google that if you want. It's, they have great atlases of maps of where we spend a lot of money. So this one is Medicare spending per capita by hospital referral region, which is a measure of a market. And the red areas spend about ten thousand dollars per beneficiary, and the yellow areas spend about five thousand dollars. So within the U.S., so forget about you know Cuba versus the U.S. Within the U.S., Minneapolis spends you know, half as much as Miami. And then the, if you look at health outcomes like survival after a heart attack to one year, they do just as well in Minneapolis as they do in Miami. So a lot of the, when you hear people say 30% of U.S. healthcare system dollars are wasted, you'll hear that a lot. It comes from this. It says that um, the, the people, they, they do just as well after a heart attack or a hip fracture or colorectal cancer in these different areas. I still worry about the cross-sectional comparison. Like people from Minneapolis look a little different than the people from Miami, all right? And and maybe they're healthier or less healthy. It's hard to know, but I do worry about. Normally, economists don't just trust. Okay, let's compare across space and just call it a day. But it is intriguing, and it there is hope that bending the cost curve won't be so difficult if there is some waste in the U.S. healthcare system. And so the the key is where to find it. The key is where to find it. That's the one thing I noticed on your previous slide. A lot of the OECD countries are heterogeneous in population. Does demographics come into play at all in, in kind of the lifespan of the U.S. versus some of the other uh, industrialized countries? I mean, the big difference is that we are somewhat richer. Um, so demographics, you, you're talking about just age and and well, uh, which demographics you're talking about? Well, just uh, race. Uh, uh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. 
we're more a more diverse community. community. Yeah. Yeah, if you know, if you just look at whites and compare them to whites in Europe, we're going to spend a lot more and we're going to live a little less. Um, but so we're disappointed. We spend so much more than you know. If you just compare whites in the U.S. and whites in Europe, and our outcomes just aren't any better. That's uh, I think that's a general takeaway. Um, so over time, it is better though. So this is from 1700 to 2000. There's some old data series that say if if you survived to age 10 and you were white in 17, you know, right around the revolution, you would expect to live to 52, 53. This is a, a numbers I'd trust a little bit more, which is um, life expectancy at birth. These are for whites. In 1850, you would expect to average age, this is at birth now, so the, there's a lot of infant mortality. But at birth, you would, the average life expectancy is 39. And then, that, and then you know, it gets up to you know, 75. And for blacks, starting in 1900, we have good data on that. It's, um, a level shift down, but it has experienced a very similar growth rate in life expectancy. So over time, things have, I've been giving you doomsday things like we're spending a lot more, we don't get any better outcomes. Here, we spend a lot more now than we used to. At least our life expectancy has been growing over time. Now, you might not want to, again, might want to, not want to correlate the two things. Sorry, one, one question. Compared to other countries, are they growing at the same rate yeah. or even faster rates? Or I don't think faster. Um, I'm more of an expert on the US healthcare system, I have to be honest. So. But the, yeah, there's been huge gains in life expectancy, especially infant mortality has been falling across the world. And as we were saying before, we don't rank so well on that anyway. So it's, um, it might be a little bit faster because of the infant mortality side, but we've all been doing pretty well. All right, this is a, I have more words on this one than usual, but so Murphy and Topel are economists at Chicago where I got my PhD, uh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> And they have a paper called Diminishing Returns that's pretty interesting. But they have these staggering magnitudes. So the gain in life expectancy in the US from 1970 to 1998, under some assumptions that are, you know, are sort of our best assumptions as economists, we would value that as in a willingness to pay at about $73 trillion. The increased cost of medical care over that time is about $46 trillion. So we've been getting this delta of like value over cost. And then they, one argument they make, which I find to be interesting, is if you were able to come up with something that would reduce cancer deaths by 1%, reduce cancer by 1%, the added value to that would be around, on the order of $400 billion in willingness to pay. So yeah, there's huge potential value in US healthcare. So if you think about where, where value is and where it could be generated, US healthcare is not a bad place to go. Um, the implications are once things are available, we pay for them in the US. So then, it does have, I think, really interesting implications for public investment. We probably want to invest in things that would reduce costs and improve lives as opposed to significantly raise costs and improve lives if we could choose, you know, if we have scarce resources and we want to devote them to, to, where, to where to go. But a lot of the spending that we subsidize is basic research that could go off wherever, uh, wherever it takes itself. And this is the Health Care Reform Act. Um, some people call it Obamacare. How, how many of you have read that? You guys read this? <laughs> Like, no congressperson has read this, so it's okay if you haven't. Um, about 10% of this is about how to expand access to healthcare, like getting people healthcare. And about this much is trying to figure out, well, how in the world are we going to reduce costs in healthcare? And so they have lots of ideas of running pilot studies of accountable care organizations or other payment methods in order to change incentives to get us um, toward a more reconcilable uh, healthcare system. But there's a lot of work to be done, and so that's why there's so many pages. All right, measuring value in healthcare. This is the second half of the talk. Um, so, wh where are the returns to spending in healthcare? So, here's a uh, potential mortality treatment relationship. So, we have mortality, let's say, after a heart attack, um, what fraction of people die. And then we have treatment intensity. How intensively do we treat those heart attack patients? We could go in and, and clear out the blockage, we can, we can insert a stent, we could actually do something much cheaper, which is just give people drugs. So, if treatment intensity is on the x axis, and mortality is on the y-axis. If we wanted to show that there's value to treatment intensity, what shape do we want this to be? What shape do you want it to be? Yeah. You want it to be downward sloping. You want it to, we're trying to estimate something like this if we we're looking for value. So here's some, I'm going to show you some data. This is mortality. Um, this is short-term mortality. I think it's seven-day mortality after a heart attack. And this is how much we spend on patients in Florida um, in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s. And this is what the scatter plot looks like. All right, so we're trying to estimate this, and the data are this. Who, yeah, try to fit a, I mean, if you really get creative, you can be like, forget this side, 
And maybe there's a down, like, there's no way you're going to get a downward sloping relationship there. So here at MIT, we love data. Data science is a big, big topic. A lot of times, my engineering friends will say, let the data speak. Let the data speak, and they will, it'll show you where, we can, where the value is. This was the, you're, you're in big trouble if you're letting the data speak here. If you actually thought treatment intensity could save people's lives. Maybe that's not true. Maybe more intensity is killing people. So you could say, OK, we're just going to spend $1,000 on people. We'd save a lot of lives, right? What do you think? Why do we get this upward sloping relationship? Why do we get the upward sloping? Yeah? Well, uh, one of the leading causes of death is medical error. Uh, however, computed in various studies of the Institute of Medicine. So the doctors are incented to induce more demand for their services, and they end up killing more patients. So you think that it's just iatrogenic. So like, yeah, we could save everybody's life if we don't send them to the hospital after a heart attack. That's probably not going to be the full story. So what do you think? Um, it could be a selection bias here, too, that the people that are really sick and have multiple blockages all over the place, if we end up treating them more intensely, they would have probably have died anyway. So yeah. we spent a lot of money on a person that, whether they got that or not, they still died. If you go to the emergency room with a heart attack, and they literally say, take two aspirin and call me in the morning, you had a mild heart attack. <laughs> if they say, oh my god, get this guy in, and like, we got to go, we have to do a lot of things to you, you are sicker, and they're spending more on you. There's this underlying, un we call it undertow of endogeneity, this is confounding factors that we spend more on sicker people. We spend more on sicker people. So these guys, if you looked at their data, they would, these guys would be older with more severe heart attacks and so on. So we could start to control for those things. But even after you control for them, you still get an upward sloping relationship between spending and mortality. And we do worry that these guys are just sicker than other guys. Now, I think that medical errors are a huge problem. And if we could get rid of them, that's like, um, like low hanging fruit, it would seem, in, ter in terms of saving lives. Um, but in terms of this overlying, underlying thing that we spend more on sicker people, that just makes my life difficult of trying to measure value in US healthcare. I'm trying to measure this. I keep getting data. I'm sorry, I'm trying to measure this. And I keep getting data that look like this. So treatment is a choice. If those of you studying econometrics or economics, it's an endogenous variable. It's something that's it's related to how sick people are. Then people in worse health get more treatment, and that just confounds these correlations. You can't let the data speak here and just be, say, call it a day. So what do we do? Well, one idea is to do a randomized experiment. I talk about the RAND health insurance experiment. If we randomize people to treatment and not treatment, or different types of treatment, then you don't have to worry about the well, some patients are just different than others. The sicker people got more treatment. Here, if we actually randomize people to treatments, then we don't have to worry about that problem. You get around that confounder. So it's big in business, right? Google does over 10,000 experiments a year. You have been in a Google, Google experiment when you clicked on Google, and it looked different than what other people see. And then they see whether your behavior changes as you see different version of Google. Or if you open up your Uber app, there's a number there called the price, or the, the estimated price. That, they could change that price for one set of eyeballs versus other eyeballs in a random way and try to figure out what people's price elasticity is. When you see a number on a screen that's called a price, that's, that's not written in stone, literally. It's, it could be different numbers for different people. And there's lots of experimentation going on in business. And we're kind of, as a business school, encouraging US healthcare to do more experimentation on the delivery side. There's plenty of experimentation, obviously, with drugs and devices, but less on how do you actually deliver care. So I'm now a co-director of the Health Systems Innovation Initiative here at Sloan. And I'm a director of the, and the health sector of JPAL, the Poverty Action Lab here at MIT. And both are, in my, both jobs, I'm sort of evangelizing this idea of having random experiments to look at healthcare delivery. So at JPAL, for example, we have over 700 affiliates in 67 countries doing largely lots of healthcare projects. 145 of the experiments are in health out of the 700. Uh, 64 of the 127 affiliates at JPAL are involved in healthcare projects. It's just, a, like I said before, there's huge value in healthcare, so people want to study it. I talked about in, in Camden, New Jersey, where I'm working with Jeff Brenner on lavishing this care management and, and making people's lives better among those really high utilizers. Well, we're doing a randomized experiment there, where we're, ran we're approaching people at bedside, saying, are you interested in this, in this program? If they are, they get randomized either into the program or to the usual standard of care. And the way we can do that is that there's a capacity constraint on that program. So there are already, there are already too many people for them to serve. So they've partnered with us to do a randomized experiment 
Um, so MIT here has a role to play as an honest broker. We, we want to get to the, you know, the truth where we, our, our reputation's on the line to do the randomization well. If he did a randomization of his own program and he found it at work, people might be worried that he, subconsciously at least he was cooking the books. But we're hoping that we avoid that by, by bringing it into third parties like us to actually study whether people randomized into the program save money and save lives versus people who are randomized out of it. So here's a CT scanner, and I'm working with a multiple sites now on clinical decision support. So this is when doctors go to order a CT scan. Information from the health record will go to this web services company, and it will, the scan itself, like the CT scan of the head for a headache, would be, um, would be seen relative to the guidelines of the American College of Radiology, and it will get a score from 1 to 9 on whether it was advised or not advised. And we're doing randomized experiments at the physician level. Some physicians will see either no decision support or different variants of decision support to see what will work. So this is a software solution to the problem of we think there's overscanning in the US. So how do we get doctors to do fewer scanning, maybe give them more information, maybe provide more hurdles, uh, maybe, I think this is pretty cool, default to cancel orders that are ill-advised and default to order the ones that are advised. So they can still undefault and if they, they can still click around and get their scan if they want to, but we're just making them think about it just a split second longer and seeing if that has effects. Clearly that's like sort of a low cost <coughs> solution to, um, you know, it's not gonna solve the problem, but it's, it's so low cost it could have huge benefits relative to those costs. And at MIT, we like to think about collecting data on everyone to see how much their lives are improved by different types of treatment. And so one thing we like is patient monitoring through your cell phone to see how fast are people walking upstairs, for example. If you go to get this treatment versus another, are people looking healthier in the way they're moving around? And we're getting this age of new big data. We can actually get pretty creative of how we're trying to measure morbidity in the US. A lot of my studies just look at mortality because it's easy to measure, whereas morbidity is the wave of the future. All right. All right, I wanted to spend the last part of my talk here on, we can't, do a we can't do a RCT, a randomized controlled trial on everything. So sometimes we look for naturally occurring random assi assignment through natural experiments. So what is a natural experiment? It aims to mimic randomized controlled trials to find naturally occurring randomization. Typically you need good data to measure things like where, it got randomized, where people got randomized where they didn't and then look at outcomes. And some institutional details like a policy change might introduce a type of experiment or treatment rules, and I'm gonna go through an example like that in a minute. So let's say measuring returns to physician care. So here in Boston Magazine, Dr. Swanson, a thoracic surgeon, was on the cover of the magazine for the top doctor, right? Look at this guy, he looks pretty confident. <laughs> if you need thoracic surgery, you know, you want this guy. And here's 2012, you have another doctor who's the top doctor. And here, my favorite, I went to Chicago, like I said, so Dr. Jensen, your gastroenterologist. If you have any you know, indigestion, this guy's your man. So like, what do these people have in common? They are beautiful, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> look, at the, look at the part on these people. Look at the parts on these people. Look at the steely gaze. This guy, <laughs> he knows what he's looking for, this guy. But seriously, what I want to know is like, if my family member got sick, how hard do I want to fight to get like Dr. Jensen or Dr. Swanson on the team? And so one question is, do prestigious physician teams deliver care differently, and do they get better outcomes? And if you just looked in the data, let the data speak, Dr. Jensen's of the world and Dr. Swanson, they're going to get okay or even worse outcomes than people who aren't as, as uh, good looking up or, um, <laughs> or notorious. So they, and the reason is, again, we have this undertow of endogeneity that the, the best doctors in your area are usually working on the most complicated cases and they can have worse outcomes, even if we try to control for how old the patients are and so on. All right, so I, I, wanted, I wanted to answer this question and I was at a cocktail party and I said, what I want to know is some setting where the patients are sort of randomly assigned to doctors or it, it's some, some rules that do that. And this person, that a, a wife of my college friend, who I will see at a reunion soon, I'm sure, said, well, I, that happens at a VA that I know of. So um, it turns out that at a large VA hospital, Veterans Administration Hospital, it's served by two residency programs. I don't know if you know this, but the Veterans Administration Hospital system trains US doctors. That's one of their missions. Every doctor that you know will probably have trained in the Veterans Administration Hospital during their residency. So this one VA hospital is in a big city and they, they serve, there are two medical schools and residency programs affiliated with those medical schools that are associated with that VA hospital. One is, by some measures, like MCAT scores of people going in, they're number one in the country. 
It's not Harvard, so it's not here. But, um, so it, w the one of the two residency programs most prestigious in the US are up there. And then the second one, if you look at the, say, the test scores of people that go there and, and the residency, um, their boards, um, when they go for their board exams, they're in the bottom quintile of the US. So you have this one institution, same nurses, same uh, specialists, same labs. So, um, everything else is the same, but one is like these are hot shot residency teams that will have an attending for, who's a professor at the medical school. They'll have a senior resident and an intern. And then they have another set of doctors that have attendings, residents, and interns that are from this less prestigious medical school. But the beauty of it, and this is where the cocktail party conversation got me going, which I got excited because I'm an economist, is that they have random assignment of patients. And how do they do that? They don't like each other. These two groups don't like each other. For 50 years, they don't like each other. So they decided to use the social security number of the patient. <laughs> Odd number social security number go to one team. Even number go to the next. So if they come back to the hospital, they still get reassigned to the same team because their SSN isn't changing. OK, that's called a natural experiment. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. <laughs> so, uh, so what do you guys think? Do you think the more prestigious team has higher costs, lower costs, or same? How many think higher costs for the more prestigious team? They like to do a lot of stuff, right? How many people think they have lower costs? How many people think it doesn't matter? All right, so we have, we have a variance of opinion. So here we go. This is the last digit of social security number, and this is log length of stay, a measure of intensity. And I call that a pronounced sawtooth pattern. There's something about <laughs> even numbered social security numbers. Well, it's clear that the even number ones, it turns out these are the less prestigious team. They have longer stays. And if you look at spending, they have higher spending. So these are, it's in log units, so about 10% higher spending overall. And if you look at things like heart failure or heart attacks, they get up to 30% differences in spending. The less prestigious team just racks up higher bills, which I found to be really interesting. And if you ask them, what, if you look in the data, you can see that they're trying to figure out what to do. They order more, a lot more tests, but they, the more prestigious team, they order, if they do order tests, they order it very quickly. The less prestigious team takes a while before they order their tests, and then they order lots of them. Also, if you talk to people at this institution, they use specialists more. So they're, they're asking for help from consultations from the cardiologist or the gastroenterologist. They're, they need, they're asking for more help. All right, so what do you think about this? So the more prestigious team, do they get better outcomes, worse outcomes, or the same? How many people think better outcomes? How many people think worse outcomes? How many people think it doesn't matter? Yeah, it turns out it doesn't matter. This is five-year mortality, which is a big you know, distance. But it, it's just not related to the Social Security number. Here's one-year mortality. It's a little bit more noisy, but you, there's no um, relationship between odd versus even in terms of mortality rates. There's no relationship between readmission <coughs> rates. So the, the big question that comes out of this paper is, could the less prestigious team act like the more prestigious one? Right? Are, are they just not confident enough? And if they could just act, they could just order their qu tests quickly, don't get the specialists involved? Could they get to the same outcomes for, the, for cheaper? or? Do they need the extra specialists and the extra tests in order to get to the same outcomes as the more prestigious team? So because there's a mountain of literature, like bigger than me, that says some places spend more than others and they get no better outcomes. And they always say that's waste. Here's a situation where one group spends a lot more, they get the same outcomes. It's not obvious that it's waste. It could be waste, but it could be that they need that extra care in order to get to the same outcomes. So it's, I think it's just an intriguing new way to look at these general feeling of, well, some places spend more and get the same outcomes, and some places they don't. All right, I got 10 minutes. I want to show you a few more graphs. Um, but yeah, so any questions about this one first? Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing maybe, from, especially from your description of the uh, test ordering, that there might be something that could be quantified around diagnostic efficiency, how often a diagnosis, tentative diagnosis is refined, how quickly they go through the differential, whether they have to backtrack through the differential, or whether they overlook a completely like, oh, there's also another cancer over here kind of problem. Yeah, so the overlooking of things that could potentially kill you in the future, I think I get with that, at that with the health outcomes. But for are their diagnoses different? We could look at diagnoses um, in the data, and they should be randomly assigned patients, right? So their underlying conditions should be the same. And it turns out that their diagnose, diagnoses look the same across the two groups. So in, at least in terms of that, um, we think that they both diagnosing about the same way, but some, one group's using consultations with specialists in order to get to some of those diagnoses and, and more tests to get to those diagnoses, and others not. I don't have um, 
and I'm excited about the wave of new data, we might be able to track how those decisions are changed. A lot of data that we have will have at the end of this day coding up well, what was wrong with the person as opposed to this click stream of what, what happened. And that's an exciting new wave of research that we can do. All right, as good as random, when I think about, when you hear that coffee saves lives or whatever in the newspaper, some kind of crazy study, you have to think about, well, are the people who drink coffee different than the people who don't drink coffee? Of course, it saves your life and it kills you, so who knows? It, it could go either way. But in general, I'm thinking, is it as good as random that whatever they're talking about today, um, the people that were exposed to those things, is it as good as random? So this is good as random, right? The last issue of SSN just is not, it is random. So let's think about another way you can think about that with treatment thresholds. So here's a paper that I wrote with friends of mine that, um, about very low birth weight newborns. This is the birth weight distribution in the US. Sorry, it's in the metric system. But you can see that there's this big distribution. Very low birth weight newborns are at 1,500 grams. So that's, it's a distinction. 2,500 grams is low birth weight. 1,500 is very low birth weight. These are round numbers in the metric system. They're not really biological markers for anything. It's just a round number in the metric system. If you zoom in on 1,500 grams, you see spikes in the data. Those are on ounces. It turns out in the US, we annoyingly measure things in ounces. Um, there's some on the grams. But it looks pretty, you know, there is, as we know from, from this, it's just going to be an uh, upward slope. But there's no real spike at 1,500 um, relative to the other spikes that are there. And what is interesting, and then if you look at predicted one-year mortality, taking out the trend, if you're just above the threshold or just below the threshold, you pretty much have the same predicted, you know, your, your health based on what we know about you, how many weeks you were um, uh, in gestation and your, your mom's background, lots of things we know from birth certificate data. Um, they look pretty similar whether you're just above or just below the threshold. But get this, if you go from, as you get um, heavier, you get healthier, right? And we spend more on sicker patients. So you're gonna get, in charges anyway, $105,000 spent on patients in this ounce bin around 1,350 grams. And it's coming down, and then it goes down. Another way I like to think about it is you're going along, you're getting more spending and more spending. And then as you cross this threshold, you get this big jump relative to the normal growth in spending as you get sicker. And the reason that is is because the very low birth weight threshold is salient to at least some physicians. Neonatology manuals will say you should do more things to this newborn because they're very low birth weight. And you can look in the data, and we see that they do more things for newborns as they just cross the 1,500 gram threshold. Interestingly, only at hospitals that don't have NICUs, neonatal intensive care units, or low level NICUs that don't have much capabilities. At the really fancy hospitals in Longwood, for example, you wouldn't see a spike, a jump at 1,500 grams. They're not using that very coarse, oh, they're 1,500 grams or less, or 14.99 or less, um, to in influence their decisions. But at a lot of hospitals, they do. And this is mortality. So you're coming down. As you get heavier, you get healthier. So the mortality rate's falling dramatically from 8% down to about 5%. And then against the trend, you see an increase in mortality. And then it comes down. And this is, it goes up a little at 1,600, but that's actually not very robust to how we bin the data. This is a very robust result that as you cross 1,500 grams, um, people are living longer. They, sh they should be just a tiny bit unhealthier, or a tiny bit healthier, but they actually, their outcomes are worse. And so putting these two things together, we spend more on the people just to the left. And they have lower mortality just to the left. And they're really similar in terms of their um, underlying health. That's pretty much as good as random whether you come out and they weigh you in your 1480 versus if they weigh you in your 1510. That's as good as random in our data. We can control for that trend and that 10 gram difference. But we wouldn't expect to see a jump in mortality going the wrong way. And so we put those two together and we find, we conclude in our paper that there are huge returns to spending for these very low birth weight newborns. We learned that this 1,500 gram threshold, if the neonatology manuals are telling you to do more at 1,499, they, they shouldn't be saying that. They should be, these guys deserve more care. Because it costs about $500,000 to save one life in this data. And our value of life estimates that you use for lots of you know, public policy comparisons are much, much higher than that. And so this is like at a bargain that you could save a life here at 500,000. Pardon me? How much does it cost again to save a life? 500,000. 500,000. Yeah. Per and the value of life we put at about 7 million. So in terms of that benefit cost, that's what economists like to do in like a general welfare um, conclusion. We look at the benefits and the costs, and we say that that's, a, that's relative to other things we do to save lives in the US, this is a, this is a bargain. 
All right, I wanted to leave you, I have, what, two minutes left, and I just want to show you a couple more graphs. So here's alcohol, another example would be alcohol and health. So these are days until your birthday, and this is where you get arrested. All right, so you're coming along, and on your birthday, you spike in, uh, in arrests. All right, I, we could put this around reunion dates or something, I don't know, but. <laughs> and the biggest spike is at 21. Why is it at 21? Of course. People are knocking back a few more tequilas, I think, at their 21st birthday than at their, 20, um, at their 20th or their 22nd. And you actually, uh, yeah, so that's I thought was just kind of cute. Um, but one thing I, I've actually been starting to talk to more high schools and about economics and, and get them excited about it. But one thing I like to show them is this graph, which are age profiles and death rates in the US. These are in months, so the dots are months, so this is the death rate per 100,000. And it's coming down as you, and these are motor vehicle deaths. So it's coming down as you get older, you get better driver, better driver, and then the month before your 21st birthday, month after, you see a big jump. Yeah, so, and then it's actually sustained. So this is like a level shift up once you turn 21. And you could argue there might be other differences when you turn 21, but I can't think of anything compelling other than that you can drive. And people have looked at this data, they've looked at places that have an 18 year, year threshold, they find that the jump happens at 18 there. When you change from 18 to 21, the, the jump changes from the 18 to the 21. It looks like it's about alcohol regulation that causes this change in mortality. And if you, I mean, always think, well, you could lecture kids all the time about don't drink and drive, but actually backing things with data can be very powerful. And this is, like, there's no other reason why you see a big jump in the death rate at 21. So this is something to take home. Maybe I'll put it up on my slides. You can, you can show uh, your, your. Is there a zero by any chance for the age of alcohol? Yeah, there's no, yeah. In place, I think people have looked, uh, yeah, people have looked at other places where there is no, um, rule at 21 and they don't find it there. And I think the most compelling thing there is places that change from 18 to 21. The jump wasn't at 21 before, it was at 18. And then it wasn't at 18 anymore, it's at 21. So that's pretty convincing to me. Uh, I don't wanna hold, one thing I never do is go over, so yeah, go ahead. If, if they had a different law, uh, I'm thinking in terms of laws, that where at 18 you could have one drink per night. <laughs> <laughs> and at, at, no, I tell myself every time I go out, I'm going to have one drink. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Could they do something like that? That would, that would certainly not that. Well, it's only if people obey the law and whether they, yeah. So they're not obeying it now. But these people, when they're, when they're 20 years old and 11 months, have a stamp on them saying they can't drink. And then now you're saying they could drink one, like sort of ease them into it is kind of an interesting idea. Um, one idea would be like never have this, Never have a law, and then there'll be no jump. But then if people start drinking earlier, you know, you might just have, you'll never be able to detect it. The point is, drinking and driving is bad. I hope that you take away. Um, so don't do it. And we have Uber now, so let's do it. All right, so takeaways. Healthcare, this huge value potential. I said 1% reduction in cancer death. Valued, you know, willingness to pay minus the cost of the treatment on the order of a half a trillion dollars. And then there's also the potential to bankrupt us. So the, you know, if we, get, we do get innovation, we get new high-tech things that are very expensive, we end up paying for them. So that's, I think, it's some food for thought of whether we want to, how much innovation do we want to have. And then in general, when I talk to people at Sloan about their startups or other things, how do they show credibly, how do they credibly show their value? And the way that I'm um, a proponent of are either randomized trials, or if you don't have those, some kind of natural experiment where you have as good as random variation across people who either got your product or didn't get your product or were exposed to your advertising, not exposed to your advertising, or got extra treatment and didn't, and then we can look at outcomes to see if there's actually value there. I don't know about you, but I had a lot of fun, even in a darkened room on the nicest day of the year, <laughs> and I attribute that to you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>